Okay, welcome to the uh, the CMC podcast. Today is part three of Myths in Rope Rescue. And at the end of part two, uh, John, one of our, our uh, participants, brought up a very interesting uh, subject that we're going to continue on with today. So uh, we'll start out by uh, having every, everyone introduce themselves so you know their voices. So John, can you start us out? I will. Uh, John McKinley, uh, recently uh, replaced as the director of the CMC Rescue School. It's still alive and well. <laughs> Thanks, John. And so we'll move on to the, the new director, Wayne. Hi, guys. Recently promoted Rescue School director. Okay. Leroy. Uh, yep. Leroy Harbach, uh, senior instructor at the CMC Rescue School. And Fred? Fred Salazar, just a dude that's been around CMC for many years. Excellent. And uh, my name is Doug McElberry. I've, uh, I'm a CMC Rescue uh, instructor also. I'm like the, the old new guy, so... Okay, so we'll uh, we'll move on uh, to our subject here. And uh, when we left off last time, we were talking about one of the big myths is people occasionally will say there's no difference between NFPA rated and non NFPA rated gear. So, John, you want to start us off with that? Well, yeah, we we ended with that, and um, we hear the comment all the time because it's not a secret that um, the NFPA rated hardware costs more than non-NFPA rated hardware. And a lot of people contend, well, it's the same thing except for those initials on it and maybe a few other pieces of wording or something like that. And um, it may or may not be true. Um, the question is, do you really know? And is it worth it to save, uh, save a buck or two on it? Um, I, I don't know what the difference is. It's going to depend on the the, the actual product, you know, it might be a dollar or two on a carabiner and it, it may be a lot more on a harness, but um, do you want to take the chance? I mean, the, uh, the NFPA system requires a lot of testing and um, the testing costs money. For some reason, um, the people want to be paid that do the testing and all of that, you know, they have insurance and they have costs and somebody has to pay for that. And unfortunately, it's the end user, but you get value for that money, and um, that's kind of the source of the discussion right now is, is it, is it the same and is it not? And um, it's a little easier to compare when you're getting hardware from the same manufacturer as both an NFPA version and a non-NFPA version than it is when you're going to another manufacturer that may not have any NFPA products at all. Their products may be perfectly strong, but they haven't gone, they haven't jumped through the hoops. And um, there's something to be said for that. If they're so sure of their product, why won't they go through the hoops? And uh, maybe we want to talk about what all those hoops are amongst us. But um, that's kind of the question. You know, it's like, do you feel lucky or don't you? <laughs> well, I, I think, too, one of the important things to, to note so our, our listeners know that, uh, John, you, you sit on the NFP 1983 committee and have for years. And uh, Wayne is in process of, uh, of uh, being in that slot also. Yeah, we. I just got a, a ballot um, result um, email today on uh, the next version of NFPA 1983 or NFPA 1983 part of NFPA 2500. That seems to be a little bit up in the air still. But um, yeah, it's an, it's an ongoing process. And uh, we as members of the committee are volunteering our time. And um, it, this year, of course, with COVID, we've been able to do our meetings online. But um, it's it's certainly a, a time commitment and, and a monetary commitment when we are traveling to meetings. But, um, you know, NFPA as an association, just the same way with ASTM, needs to cover their costs and they need to sell standards. So the individuals have to buy them, although you can reference them online. But again, going through that process costs money. And uh, we're well aware of that on the committee. Um, there's, as all standards committees like that, they have what they call balance. There are more users than there are manufacturers. And in the case of CMC, we're a manufacturer, although we're also users. But, um, you know, there's a lot of mistaken on ideas on that where they go, oh, the manufacturers just come in and cram this stuff down our throats. That's not true. There's more users on those committees and they can easily outweigh the manufacturers in their voting. Well, and it's kind of interesting to say that because, I mean, if you look historically, the NFP in 1983 was actually driven by end users and, and you know, was basically NFP 1983 started as a result of a very unfortunate incident. Yeah. And in 
that first version, there was only one real rope manufacturer that even sat in on the meetings. Well, yeah, and then the first version, which the first product was rope, and again, as as you mentioned, the standard came because people were dying. Standards are written in blood. They don't. Nobody just sits around and says, "Hey, let's do this." It's because something happened, and then they said, "How can we prevent this from happening again?" And uh, as you pointed out, the first version of 1983 was only about eight pages long, and it really only covered rope. And quite honestly, and I know people that were on the committee when the when the standard was first introduced, no rope met the standard as uh, until after it was done. But there, the standard has improved the quality of the product because the standard was so stringent. The manufacturers came to the table and and developed product to meet them. And right there, that's that's something is an advantage to the standard. And one of the other interesting things too, that original standard really didn't have any definitive test methods. It referenced some other standards. It referenced some things. But the new standard, the current standard, is very well defined about how products will be tested. Well, it's to say that every edition improves. Not only did it get longer, it covered more products, and it was a lot more extensive. I mean, and you think about the 30 years or whenever it's been, uh, we've learned a lot of things about testing. We've learned a lot of things about standards. And it doesn't have to apply to rope rescue equipment. It can apply to ladders or or anything else that we use. But um it, that's why the standards need to be reviewed and revised every five years to make sure they are up to date with the latest and greatest in both um, maybe metallurgy, manufacturing processes, and testing procedures. And I, I think maybe if we could uh, get Fred to weigh in, because he's one of the guys that's kind of a, a gear freak, if you will. He likes testing the new stuff coming out, so he's had a chance to see some of the early versions of stuff and, and, and has tested it and given input all the way and has seen how the end product then that ends up being NFPA approved. What are your thoughts, Fred? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we, we have to be honest about um, for us as rescuers is we're going to push the limits of our gear. Um, And so I think the certification gives us a little bit more of that feel good and something to go back to, to base, you know, how far can we push it? You know, I've been lucky enough working for CMC that when new equipment comes to market, you know, I get to see the various iterations, um, especially with harnesses. And you realize you start looking at stitch patterns and how stitching pulls where pieces are sewn together. um, And you learn about, okay, to be an NFPA certified harness, it has to pass this test and this test and it's dropped in this fashion and If you have this attachment, you can use it for weight bearing versus, you know, just positioning and the constant modifications to meet the standards. Because like John has said, there's something has happened somewhere down the road that's made itself into the standards, which, again, just kind of directs how we're going to develop our equipment. And then as our techniques change. You know, we look at the standards. Hey, how does it figure into that? Um, and it all comes down to, you know, how far are we going to push it? And what are you willing to risk? Good point. Wayne, what are, what are you, you've uh, been, you're kind of getting into the NFP in 1983 uh, committee now. And I know you've got some, some pretty uh, uh, strong opinions on some of this. What, what are your thoughts? Personally, like I said in the previous podcast, I like standards. Um, I know some people have uh, <clears throat> issues with them in the sense that they think gear costs more money. But when you buy a product that is third-party certified, what you get is a known quantity, right? You get a piece of gear that has gone through a standardized testing process. The end user knows what he's getting, right? The whole Three Sigma uh, math formula let, lets that person know Hey, 99.87% of the time or more, right, this gear is going to yield at a higher number than this right here. Right, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm just a big standards guy, always have been. Um, I understand uh, the beef, but for the end user, I would imagine it's nice to know that, hey, I have a piece of gear that's been thoroughly vetted. A company has procedures in place. There's a recertification table in 1983 that tells how often these things get recertified, all pieces of gear. 
Yeah, that's that's my opinion. Well, and then maybe if you could kind of highlight too some of the other portions of that that people that may not be as familiar with. Uh, you talked about the frequency of testing, but also, you know, the on-site inspections and so on. Could you kind of highlight some of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, 1983 is very clear that they have unannounced visits. Um, you know, uh, John, being a longtime uh, school director, could probably speak to it better. But these people come in. I remember talking to a previous employee there. These people come in and they pull gear and they go off and they test it. There is no advance. Hey, we're coming this day. It just happens. And they're... The recertification table in 1983 says how often these things are retested. And uh, so you're constantly being forced to provide quality gear, right? Uh, the, out, the whole ISO uh, process, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's not just, it's not just the third-party testing, right? It goes through the, the laboratory, the, the company itself, everything. It's, it's, it's quite a process. And, and, and actually, it's, it's more than just one phase because you have – the whole ISO annual auditing process to make sure your manufacturing and quality control systems are in place. But then you have UL, who happens to be who CMC contracts with to make sure they're NFPA compliant, coming and making unannounced visits and sampling, um, as Wayne just talked about, along with the fact that um, when products change in that annual cycle or semi-annual cycle or whatever it is based on the standard, where we're sending products um, to the UL laboratory to actually be tested. And there we know what's going, but um, all of that costs some money. And, and that's what I think people don't understand is that none of this is free, but it does give you some sort of a value. And, um, you know, I, I, I can see it for, you know, people that you don't want to pay the money, either individuals or departments, obviously rescue equipment, something like, you know, is, is not, maybe the highest priority of some places um, and everybody has a funding issue, but um, you know, there's no free lunch on the thing if you want to get it and look at it. People are not dying because equipment is breaking or anything like that. Leroy likes to use a comment. I'm sure he'll pick up on it. If I segue, there are no pile of bodies. Well, maybe there's no pile of bodies because the stuff is good when there used to be, or there could have been. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of validity to that. I mean, where's the pile? You know, um, and I think the other thing that standards do is I think it forces rescuers to get educated, to get smarter. You look at just the descender standard, the how much less or lighter, whatever term you want to use, as far as rating is concerned of the new 1983 standard versus previous editions. You know, which is, and it's a substantial, significant difference between the two overall. And it's the same thing with T rated gear. You know, you're looking at carabiners, T rated carabiners these days are coming in at um, 22 KN, which is what the standard says, which is lighter than it used to be. It used to be 27. I think before that it was actually 30. You know, so you're seeing this gradual as, as I think as end users get better educated, that in turn reflects in the standards overall that that education starts to reflect into more realistic numbers, I guess, with some fudge factor built in for the just in case. And part of the I think one of the things John touched on that that value added and none of us as rescuers really want to touch on it, but. If you're a bean counter, you know, if you're using certified equipment that meets a standard, that gives you a little umbrella of safety because we're such a litigious society anymore. Any chance, anything we can sue for, if something goes wrong, we're going to exploit it. So the bean counters, the lawyers are going to go, hey, man, spend the extra $5 on this NFPA certified carabiner because that could potentially save us millions of dollars down the road. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're saving huge amounts of money because it gives us something to reference, to hang our hat on. And then it comes back down to best practice, standard of care. And what I used to say, and, and most of our audience is probably too young to remember this, but four out of five dentists recommend chewing sugarless gum. You know, what makes that one other dentist you know, so smart that he says, eat sugary gum. He wants to make money. 
So if most rescuers are using a certified piece of gear, what makes you so special that you don't? And then they, they start playing that kind of game. If, if something goes down, it's definitely... First off, that was spoken as the son of a dentist, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's false economy. You know, when it comes down to it, and, and, and God forbid, we hope nothing ever happens to anybody, but should something happen to them and it found out that it wasn't a certified piece of equipment. Obviously, things can happen using certified pieces of equipment. But let's say in this situation, it was because the equipment was flawed. That false economy of that dollar or two that might have been saved is long time out the window when it comes to not only the monetary and emotional costs of something having and bad to happen to anybody. And Like Fred says, if, if somebody can figure out a way to make it your fault, we all know that that's something that we deal with in public safety all the time. And uh, you just have to keep that in mind. It's like, was that two bucks worth it? Uh, I guess not, you know. Well, and then one other kind of twist, if you will, in this, and uh, we've we've kind of mentioned it in the, in the last two in this series when we've talked about NFPA, is some states require, like, in, for instance, in, in the the area of the, of the country where Leroy and I are from, that's literally part of the state's, uh, it's in the state statute. SPS 330 says, that, you know, thou shalt use NFPA 1983 uh, compliant gear. And Wayne, you've pointed out uh, FEMA requires it also. Yep. FEMA committees do. I sat on one for six years, seven years. And then many states then mirror that. Uh, the state I'm from, California, had it in their uh, documents and still do to this day. So just to, to you know, kind of tag team on Fred's comment there, you know, not only from a litigious standpoint, but also potentially from a, a state, you know, enforcement. If there's ever an accident and you're caught and you don't use complaint, you're, you could be opening yourself up to a huge problem there. Yeah, I think it goes back to every agency, whoever's using this gear, to figure out if, if, if that's what they want to do. Um, but like I said, many, many places, I've sat on multiple committees in my career, and overwhelmingly, they all required NFPA compliant gear or NFPA certified gear. Okay. Were you, were the, I, I'm going to have to get on my soapbox here. And I actually had to look on the back of this device to make sure. Um, <clears throat> I do want to point out NFPA does not certify right. anything. It's classified. <laughs> yes, it's classified. It's classified. Yep. Yeah. We've had this discussion with the uh, guy that actually owned and started CMC who had to counsel me at length uh, during one of the product videos early on, shall we say, because I kept using the, tame, the term, oh, it's certified. And he's like, no, it's classified. And I think that was about 42 takes worth of classified, not certified until they actually got <laughs> to the point where he wrote it on the big whiteboard off camera, classified, not certified. So, um, yeah, it's it's classified to the standard and tested in accordance with, which essentially, you know. Yeah, and I believe certification applies to the organization. Correct. And I think part, you know, Leroy, you highlighted, it comes a lot down to semantics and people, mm -hmm. you know, we know what you mean. What you said is a little bit different, but the, the intent and the understanding is there. And I, and I don't disagree, but there are always those out there that will leap on that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because 1983 actually defines the term compliant, right? Certified or uh, as meeting or exceeding all applicable requirements of this standard. Right, right. out of the definitions. Mm -hmm. Right. So and, and, and terms change over time. I think we all know what we mean when we say it. But yeah. Um, it, it does matter in this case to be as accurate as possible. And the, for me, you know, I'm 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 not the standards nerd or anything like that by by any means. But for me, is is the understanding. I'm not a purist by any means, um, but to have the understanding so that I knew what Leroy was talking about. Um, the term, the semantics, uh, aren't purist but the intent was received in the fashion that he tried to send it. Um, and as many agencies try to be as NFPA compliant as possible, I think all this on, on this chat, no, it is financially impossible 
to be a NFPA compliant agency. So we pick and choose, and, and it's basically a hazard risk assessment on which ones you're going to pick and which ones you don't, and which ones you apply and which ones you don't. Well, and I have to, uh, kind of a little bit of a, a, a background here too, since our, our listeners can't see uh, the screen that we're on where we can actually see each other. When Leroy was speaking of the device, he was actually holding up a clutch. And I think it's ironic that Leroy holds the record probably for the most uh, uh, initial prototypes broken in testing <laughs> of said device. And I purposely bring that up because that is an, an integral part of the standards process is it isn't like somebody comes up with this and the first time, you know, the first device that you come up with is the one that's going to go through the process and get going to get certified. It's it, uh, that was just the well, the clutch that was a what a six or five year process. And that's actually a big thing, and it kind of gets into back a little back into a little bit of what John was talking about as far as you know additional expense. I mean, anybody or any company worth their salt is going to prototype and do in house testing to make sure that when you have to pay for the additional testing according to the NFPA standard that you know before it goes there, it's going to pass. Right, sure. Because there's mm -hmm. nothing worse than, oh, gee whiz, we sent all these really cool things and, you know, I sent five of them and now they all came back in broken pieces. Or, I'm, John, I'm not even sure if you get the broken pieces back, but it didn't pass. And, you know, because your standard deviation was insanely bad which we've seen before. And I think John can speak to this and I'll, I'll reference, you know, harnesses, you know, depending on what the modification or change is to a piece of, of equipment, it may have to be retested again. So, you know, is it a cosmetic change or is it a structural change? Like maybe you're changing a stitch pattern where now that entire piece of gear needs to be sent out and tested again because something structural, something of substance was changed in that piece of equipment. It just wasn't, you know, spit and polish. Well, that's very true. And um, that's something in, in just in the course of product improvement, um, we go through and, and certainly that's not my, my particular area of ex expertise at CMC or wasn't, but, um, you know, we make some changes and we have to go back to the certifying organization and say, hey, we're changing this. And it, let's just say it's a gear loop. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, manufacturers change, somebody doesn't make it anymore, we've decided to improve the product other ways. Um, you go back to them and say, we're going to make this change. Do we need to, to resubmit the samples or don't we? Now, in the case of a gear loop, no, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. It's not, um, you know, a load bearing component, so that's not a problem. But sometimes just a matter of changing the geometry of the harness, we may find for, for whatever reason, now, all of a sudden, it's going to it's going to be different. The way the harness rides on the mannequin, the way it comes through the test, it's like, no, you're going to have to redo it. And something I think Leroy said that I was going to ask is there are certainly a lot of manufacturers out there, and not all of them choose to go through this process. And my question always is, if, you're, if your stuff is so good and you say that it meets the standard, which you can't legally do anymore, you, not, you know, NFPA is protecting themselves in that direction, but... Why aren't you submitting, you know, it's like put your money where your mouth is and prove that your stuff is that good if you're going to, if you want to go that way. And obviously there's manufacturers that, that manufacture that really started this whole discussion, NFPA gear and non-NFPA gear, because they do it for different markets. The NFPA gear is for, the, for primarily fire or other public safety types of markets that require NFPA. And uh, they may make equipment for uh say arborist or something, it doesn't require it. And, and then, you know, then there's that price point and that makes sense, but it may in fact be different. Again, um, I, I would, I would certainly say, and, and there's many people at CMC that would probably say this louder than I am. And certainly other manufacturers that it is not easy. It's very frustrating. It's very expensive. There's a lot of procedures to go through and, um, I'm sure that there was lots of people that say, I don't have the staff, I don't have the patience or whatever it is to go through that process. But it's something that, um, you know, if it, that, that you really need to do eventually. Um, and, and that's what kind of concerns me is, 
that what if. Yeah, I know you say it's good, but how can I do it? And remember, most of these tests are destructive. So uh, individuals aren't buying stuff and testing it on their own. It's just money down the drain. So it's it's not an easy process. Don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't take a lot of uh, staff time and expense to comply with these product uh, standards, um, whichever standard they are. Well, maybe if, if I could uh, jump in here, John, and maybe you guys can talk about, too, just the evolution of the testing process itself. I mean, I can remember some of the early testing that was done when NFPA 1985, you know, when it, or uh, 83 first came out in 1985, into the 1990 edition when it was laid out that, you know, it has to be third-party testing. They literally didn't know how to test some of this stuff, and that's even more recently they've really had to, the testing laboratories have really had to partner with the manufacturers, and maybe you can give some examples of that, in how to test the products to effectively make sure that it, they're testing what needs to be tested to meet the standard and to, you know, to, to show what you're trying to show. Well, yeah, and, and that's, that's part of it is because the testing process and, and having been involved in, 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 in this both with NFPA and, and more extensively with the ASTM, um, I've written some bad stuff. I'll admit it. You know, it sounded really good on paper and it sounded good to a lot of people on paper, not just me. And um, then all of a sudden when you got down to doing it, there was a lot of nuances that you didn't anticipate. And in some cases, and I'll, I'll use the litter standard, for example, the individual products are very expensive. So it's just not like you can pull them out and test them. Um, not like they're free, but, you know, a carabiner is a lot easier to test than a litter is, and it certainly costs a lot less money, and the test is a lot less involved. But we found when it came time to really doing the test on a, on a real basis uh, and a, that it wasn't written as well as it could be. And, you know, since then, the tests have been modified. But you've seen that happen to a lot of the standards where, again, that five-year cycle we go back in there and say, did this work and didn't? And lots of times the tests, um, when you find the testing organizations, like I said, UL, they'll go in and say, this isn't really working like that. And then we'll attempt to do a modification and then, you know, make it, you know, in the standard, uh, you know, change the standard later. But it, it's not easy to anticipate everything that's going to happen. And a harness is another example, the way the harness rides on the mannequin and all that things can be, can be pretty uh, important on the way the test goes. And yeah, maybe if you could uh, elaborate maybe on that, because this isn't just like you send these in a box, send them to UL, and they test them, right? There's actually engineers and designers that actually travel to there to accompany the product, correct? Yeah, whenever we have things tested, uh, we send somebody from manufacturing, uh, from engineering to go to witness the tests and everything like that, just to make sure that, just to make sure that it all goes right. And if it doesn't go right, to know why it didn't go right. So it's a firsthand experience, if you will. It's just one of those things that I think probably all the manufacturers do. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's another expense, but it's something you have to do to make it right. If for some reason it doesn't pass, and uh, I'm sure everybody's had those experiences where you test things in-house and then you test them at UL and things come out differently. And um, they vary. There's no secret about it. You know, that's why we have to test so many samples. So maybe we should discuss, too, kind of the end result of this as far as what gear should be. And there's because there's actually specific uh, gear that is and uh, I should say specific fields in rope rescue that are specifically exempted from using 1983 gear. Correct. Well, at the beginning of 1983, it talks about different things like. Um, you know, cave rescue and mountain rescue and things like that that aren't necessarily in there. I mean, it just, it's designed for the fire service, and uh, there may be applications that aren't in there where, you know, that isn't really necessary. And then one could say, well, maybe they should be and maybe they shouldn't be, but that's probably a little bit more of an argument that we need to get into today um, yeah. as far as the ramifications of that. But certainly there's some politics involved, I'm sure. Well, I think, too, one of the, one of the things is if you're operating above your anchor point, the, the they very that's very that's a very specific exemption of NFP in 1983. Exactly, yeah, because it's a different kind of rope. That there's no NFPA standard for a dynamic rope, and a dynamic rope is what you should be using if you're climbing above your anchor. And so that's a specific reason why some of those things, 
because that's a very common occurrence in um, in cave rescue, in in mountain rescue, in climbing, and in some cases in tower rescue, where you need to use a different kind of rope, and there's no standard for that kind of rope, uh, at least in the, no NFPA on that. And I think that's been one of the nice evolutions too, is the standard has evolved over time. I mean, if you look at that first version of the standard, you know, one of the basically it talked about the circumference of the rope, and in order to be a because they didn't have T and G, it was a one or two person rope. The rope had to be over a half inch in diameter to meet the two person standard. It was it had to be a fat half to to meet it, and it could be just up to just under three quarters. And if you look, it was. Uh, the breaking, the stretch at breaking was, I think, between 15 and 55 percent or 15 and 55 percent. So it's, it's really come a long way. So maybe let's talk a little bit about, you know, what impact should using NFPA gear have on the way we use the gear? Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, there, I know there's going to be some some good ones come out of this because I've heard each of you guys tell you know stories about changes in techniques based upon the evolution. And uh, I know Fred has one right away. And I know uh, if I, if, Leroy, if I could have you uh, uh, talk about uh, litters after Fred gets done. So my take on certified gear and, and its usage, I've, I've been lucky enough to travel around the U.S. and internationally teaching classes. Um, I've had the opportunity to see different brands and if they say uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, <laughs> uh, apparently some of you know where I'm going with this. Um, there is some equipment out there that holds brand names that looks identical or it could look not quite right. You know, the coloring could be off just a little bit. They could use a label that was a year older. The stitch pattern could be just a little off. You don't know what the quality of gear is. It looks it looks like good gear. It looks almost identical, but it's just not quite right. Um, you know, there's there's manufacturers here in the U.S. I looked at a harness. I'm like, man, that's an old CMC harness. That's not a CMC harness. The stitch pattern, they took the harness, they deconstructed it, they used the same stitch pattern, they didn't, you know, it looked identical, but it didn't have that NFPA kid-tested, mother-approved label on it. So do you know how strong it is? So what that certification does, the kid-tested, mother-approved label, it gives you that good feeling and that place to go back to going, oh, it beats this and it's this strong and it was tested this way, this way, this way versus something produced, who knows where, mass produced. Do you know the quality of, of the base components? Do you know the quality of the webbing, the stitching, whatever it may be? So it gives you something to rest your, your base knowledge on of what your performance requirements of that piece of equipment should be. Okay. And I'm not going to say the knockoffs aren't going to have the kid tested mother approved label because they'll knock that off too. But we've seen it with other manufacturers where they get out the alerts, look at the label, the E may be a little off or the C E, the E may be a little off or a letter may be a little off. And you know, Hey, that's a knockoff. It's not that brand that you're looking for. When I think the importance there is, you know, buy it from a reputable dealer, not off of eBay or, you know, from an unknown source. But if you buy it from an actual, you know, whoever the dealer, whether it be a CMC product from a CMC dealer or, you know, another manufacturer from their approved dealers, that's how you eliminate that from happening. Exactly. Yeah. So, Leroy, I know you got a, a good litter story as far as techniques. Yeah, it... Um well, especially with some of the newer, well, in particular with the new standard that's out there, um, you know, the new litter standard, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but the manufacturer specifies what are load-bearing components. Yes. Okay. So, um, and this goes back to way back in the day, Doug, um, <laughs> snow plowing through lake banks <clears throat> and bending litters actually 
pretty disgustingly. I, and I still have one of those, by the way, <laughs> um, that, that uh, managed to move up, I think, about two and a half cubic feet of clay um, as it was coming up over an edge without a high point. But then it, when you look at those um, UL things, um, and this is this is a little bit dated, but it was a a litter that was made without a UV inhibitor. Um, <laughs> that um, you know the it was plastic or essentially PVC coated, mm-hmm. but it did not have a, a UV inhibitor, and it was I'll, I'll call it the main the the. The organization where I happened to be said it was essentially new or little used, shall we say. Um, and if I recall, this this particular device also had an aluminum frame rather than uh, a stainless steel, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just the round the top rail. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were discussing, you know, various things, various techniques, you know, packaging a patient in a litter, for example. And they didn't want to lift up people, so we put a bunch of hose and that type of stuff, you know, a mannequin on the inside and proceeded to raise it up, and the bottom fell out of the litter. The bridle didn't fail, mind you, but the bottom of the litter literally stayed on the ground while the framework went up in the air, which was kind of an interesting event, which is when we got into the whole classification of equipment and certificate, you know, certified gear and all of those things. Because uh, it is something that with the newest standard, with the newest 1983, um, and John, correct, was it this last standard or the last version of 80, 1983 or was the previous standard with the vertical litter testing? I believe it was the one before last, but I won't swear to it. Time flies and I forget. Yes, yeah, it's the same here. Um, I knew I should have looked at my notes before this. Because some of the techniques, as as those techniques change and, you know, vertical litter applications and those kind of things become more readily smaller team tactics type of things, that if litters, you know, is, the, is that piece of equipment or is that litter actually rated for what you were doing with it? You know, is it rated in a vertical? Because not all litters are made the same. I mean, we all know that, you know, XYZ different manufacturers all have it's a substantially similar construction, but if I want to attach on the midpoint, does that litter even have a midpoint that allows it to go in that vertical configuration to begin with? And so it does come down to every different, you know, is it actually rated for what we're doing with it? I mean, we've, as, as Fred mentioned before, we have a tendency to, um, to push equipment to the edge of its <clears throat> capabilities on occasion. And um, I know that there have been times, especially because I've been with Fred in some of those locations that may or may not be in the United States, where equipment gets tested in manners that it's really, or used in manners, it's really not designed for or intended to be yeah. used in that particular manner. It's kind of like using a uh, pipe wrench for a hammer, right? <laughs> I mean, every problem's a nail, so everything becomes a hammer. Well, and kind of one of the other things I was thinking of, too, with the basket is um, if you look in, like, the, the, the CMC Rope Rescue Man, we specifically do not show using tails, you know, whether it be a long tail bowline or a long tail butterfly, and tying the patient in with that, you know, with a tail, and mm-hmm. back in the day, in the early manuals, that was shown. Right. But you nicely, you usually point out, well, there's a reason why, right? The equipment yeah. has changed. Well, yeah. and, and as the gear gets stronger, and as the equipment gets stronger, and it goes through that testing process, when you look at it overall, um, and I think Wayne threw the stat out there before, if it's a, if it's a tested piece of equipment, it's, it falls under the three sigma test. You know, 99.87% of the time, it will fail higher than what it's actually rated. Um, now, the litter standard is slightly different. Um, and I don't believe they use a three sigma test because it's just an inherent, you know, kind of a big problem as far as breaking litters. But when you look at it overall, the equipment is that much stronger. You know, there, there's a trade-off on everything, right? There, there's always a trade-off. 
we work with some organizations that are like, no, this is what we do. Is there anything wrong with it? No. But do you understand why you are doing it? Is it because we've been doing it that way for 35 years or, you know, and we've never had a problem with it? Or is it, you know, let's face it, I'm a retired fireman. So are you. So is Wayne. John's retired, but he's not a fireman. But, you know, public safety kind of guy. Fred's wishing for Fred's wishing to be like us. (laughs) <laughs> as far as retired is concerned. Um, but there's two things that firemen hate, right? Change and the way things are. I guess I kind of look at it, and, and I was very fortunate. The organization that I work for, it was relatively easy to change things. Hey, we're going to change this technique. We're switching to this new hardware. You took the team, you trained them first, and then you got the rest of the organization up to speed. Larger places... Not quite as not quite as easy. You know, it's kind of like turning an aircraft carrier in the harbor. Can it be done? Yes, but it, you got to be patient. When those techniques change, if if people can, if, and I and I never I never get into, I will air quote discussions with people <laughs> on technique because if it works and it's safe. A lot, of, a lot of times it just falls into my who cares category. It's, there's a million ways to solve any given problem. As long as the equipment is used in a proper manner, whether a guy ties a, ties a long tail bowling or not, I, I really don't care. You know, it's like, do I have to put a safety knot on a figure eight on a, on a bike? I mean, that to me is one of those falls into my who cares. <laughs> you know, it, it does. It falls into my who cares yep. thing. And you look at some of the video confirmation that's out there, you know, tails that are an inch short or don't even finish and the knot doesn't come apart. It, that, that's why I said it just kind of falls into my who cares category. I'm not saying don't finish your knots. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Although I'm sure that somebody that's listening to this at this point in time, that's what they heard. But that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Leroy, you bring up an interesting point, and we, we do see some people do this, right? They put the tails on, and they tie mm-hmm. to the patient, and they say, okay, now I've got two points of contact. But how many times have you heard in my career say, think A to Z, not A to X? If right. that litter lets go, this guy's going to fall a foot or two, however long the tail is, and he's going to snap in half because the belay line is now attached to his waist. And we'll see people in classes, right. they'll, they'll, they'll tie on a... Uh, a belay to a chest harness, well, how many patients in certain rope environments are wearing a full body harness? And if they are, does it have a real connection at the chest? They typically don't, right? Those are nice rescue harnesses, not a industrial harness that we'll see at a plant. Right. And if you, and, and if you think about it during a rescue, I mean, I have yet to be on a rescue that somebody had a harness on unless in, now, in the environment that I worked in, right, outside of the industrial environment, nobody walks around with a harness on. Right. You know, and I think that that should be mandated, that everybody wears at least a class two harness everywhere, wherever they go. Or, you know, that we should have that big that big uh, U-bolt put in the base of the the base of the cervical spine there, you know, kind of like the dummies have. Yeah, there that you go. Everybody has that in, you know, permanently installed like at birth. Um, and then every 10 or 15 years you go in and get a new one put in because God knows that's the way that most rescues happen, right? Well, hey, it's kind of interesting. Oh, go ahead, Fred. Doug, I was going to say, I mean, this, this ties into what we were talking to uh, offline about redundancy. And, you know, we talk about, well, where do you do redundancy? You know, what kind of equipment are you using? It goes back to understanding the standard and how equipment is tested so that you have confidence in doing what you do. Because we can do all this redundancy. And as my good friend John McKentley preaches, Uh he will never do a rescue wearing two harnesses. That's right. Because it always comes down to... Whoever you're hooking up to is only wearing one harness. If that harness fails, your redundancy is out the window. So, you know, I think John in, in 
retirement is going to find a way to make a redundant harness and cash in on that. <laughs> um, and you can connect to the same point on that single harness too. Yeah. It, yeah. It, so yeah. I, I think this is, this is the perfect example of, you know, that broad, even beyond technical thinking, understanding the standards of testing for equipment. So you know how it's tested. You have that confidence in your application and you can go, yes, it needs to be redone here. No, it doesn't have to be redone here. Or we can do what our rope access friends do and double up 76 K and anchor plates where your anchor is actually going to fail before your hard goods are. <laughs> um, it, it just doesn't make sense. So using Wayne's analogy, A to Z thinking, understanding the standards and what it means and taking that knowledge all the way through to the end um, of how you train and how you do your restings. Well, and I, and, oh, go ahead, John. I was going to say, if I can jump in for something, it was a little bit of what I said and a little bit of what Leroy said. First off, when I was talking about litters and litter standard, I should probably point out to the listeners that the NFPA 1983, when it talks about litters, refers to a, the ASTM standard for litter testing, and that's not unusual in the standards world for one standards making organization to refer to another already accepted standard out there. And uh, that's just the case in, in, it's a case of many of the standards that we see in 1983, it will refer to an ASTM standard for testing a carabiner, or testing litter or something like that. And um, in the case of litters, because of their expense, it only requires um, two litters be tested in each of the directions, horizontal or, or vertical, and then the lower number is reported. So uh, it, it doesn't go back into that, you know, it, it isn't a situation of a three sigma or anything like that because, you know, because of the expense of the individual item, it's just, it's more or less a pass fail and they test two. But um, also remembering that they're, you know, they're, they're jig welded manufactured items and there's really not a lot of variations in them. The other thing that kind of goes back to litters, and this related to the to the story that you guys had about the bottom of the litter finding out, is we all know that there's been some cases of that. Generally, with plastic litters, it might have been because of UV. It might have been a metal litter because of rust, a steel litter. I just saw a picture of one that I had heard a story about, and ten years later, I saw the same litter that was stored in a in a very humid environment and totally rusted through. Nowadays, with stainless steel litters, that's less of an issue, or titanium. But I know, becoming from the mountain rescue environment, there are mountain rescue teams that will habitually take webbing and interleave it all around the top rail of their webbing of their litter. Excuse me. In in the in the case that the litter were to fall apart, and there just really aren't cases of litters falling apart like that. It's not it, it it's not a big problem. It hasn't been a big problem. But it's kind of like, well, let's do it because we always did it. And now is that really necessary? And I think tying on to the victim is the same situation. I know it's it's moving into a different subject, but why are we doing this? You know, where are the cases of these litters, you know, falling apart all the time that you need to put this webbing around the top rail? And that wouldn't help you any in the plastic litter that fell apart with the bottom fell out of it anyway. And um you know, what kind of forces are you putting on these things so that they fall apart that much? And will your patient even survive it? You know, are we, it looks good and makes us feel better, but is it in reality something that we need to be taking our time and effort on? Yeah, you've ticked that box of having redundancy, but does that redundancy actually work A yeah. to Z? Two, right? two, litter, two, two ropes tied to the top of the litter harness, you know, may not be totally redundant because we're not using the same, we're backing up the litter harness. But the reality is, okay, you know, unfortunately, it's like we, we, we've got a rope on our, our victim, but our victim's not viable anymore if the litter fell apart or the harness all fell apart, and it's not. And uh, kind of going back to litter harnesses, because I've been looking at some old pictures and variations in those things, goes back to the standard again. We know of situations where people were using perfectly good webbing but they were using non-standard needles, non-standard thread patterns, and non-standard thread, and they were sewing anchor straps and litter harnesses and things like that on their own to try and save some money, but they might have been using, or in some cases we know they were using cotton thread. You know, the standard says that the thread has to be the same material, 
made out of the same plastic, if you will, as the base material. So if it's a fireproof harness, a fire resistant harness, it needs to have FR thread. And uh, you can't use cotton thread on a nylon or polyester webbing. And people had things that, and they worked good right at the beginning, but they aged differently. And um, there were some incidents because of that, you know, and, it, and, and again, a, a viable standard and somebody that submits the testing, you shouldn't have that problem. Well, and again here, I think uh, what's happened, I'm looking at our time here, and I think uh, John has very uh, efficiently opened up a can of worms at the very end here or something. And and I I guess one of the things I want to kind of top off by saying is NFP 1983 is a manufacturer standard. It's not a use standard. And it's important that we all remember that. All this is is it's the standard that the manufacturers have to meet if they want NFPA compliant I'll make Leroy happy there. NAFPA Thank compliant you. gear. So I, I think what we've got is a subject for another podcast here discussing how does the use of NFPA 1983 compliant gear interface with, you know, with different ways that we use it. We can talk about some of the testing that's been done because I know there was just some recent testing on litters where they actually had the person, the victim tied in and they failed the litter bridle. It wasn't pretty. But I think that uh, that's a that's a uh, a subject unto itself here. So anything, uh, Wayne? Anything to to wrap us up here? No, uh, good conversation. Thank you. So, Fred, um, just to, to sum it up, standards give you something to hang your hat on at the end of the day. Excellent, Leroy. I agree with Fred. I mean, you got to have a starting point. As a guy who used to make recommendations on equipment, um, it gives you as an end user the ability to compare apples to apples as opposed to apples and bananas or whatever. Um, Because a lot of times, at least with the organization I came from, it wasn't necessarily about money. It was keeping in compliance with those state statutes that said, you will do this, but it gave you the opportunity to compare pulleys, rope, depending on the characteristics, what exactly am I looking for? But you could do a side-by-side comparison knowing that the, the equipment that you're looking at has all been through the same testing process. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. And so, John, since you opened up this can of worms last time, uh, how would, anything you want to add to finish this off here? No, I seem to have done it again, and I believe me, <laughs> on both times it was totally <laughs> accidental. Um, hopefully my uh, my view on standards, having participated in so in them so long, I, I'm very much became a standards geek and and uh, feel very passionately about it. And I don't expect everybody to agree with me, but I uh, how I started it last time was I hear a lot of misunderstandings about the standards. I mentioned the one about, oh, it's all driven by the manufacturers, and that's not true. And um, so, I, you know, we, we want to correct those things and get good information out to people. And again, hey, folks, uh, hopefully these are interesting for the listeners. And, um, you know, keep those cards and letters coming if you've got suggestions of not only topics, but uh, ways that we can make them better for you. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, guys. And uh, thanks to our listeners uh, for listening to another CMC podcast.